want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. Matthew, chapter 28, we'll be looking in verses 1 through 10. And as you turn there, I was just sitting over there thinking as Kevin and uh, this praise team that did just a wonderful job, they're giving y'all an applause all over virtual land out there right now. And uh, we certainly do appreciate uh, them uh, doing the um, leading us in worship this morning. Uh, I really enjoyed the sunrise service this morning in the parking lot in the cars. Uh, first time I ever got amen with a car horn before, but uh, it was good. They even had some dogs amen to me out there. And uh, but also want to thank uh, all of our deacons for uh, helping uh, uh, coordinate everything. Want to thank David and Tisha for uh, uh, setting up the trailer and Kevin. And just a lot of a uh, lot of things go on that uh, we really do appreciate, and uh, we thank you so much. I was just thinking a lot's changed since last year. Last year, about this time, we were getting ready to go into a renovation project, and we got all that done and spent the summer over in the school, and then went through Christmas. And now I believe this has got to be the smallest Easter service I ever preached to, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, I know that you're here with me, but it's just not the same without having people uh, here, and I look forward to the day when we can get back together and, and worship the Lord as his people together in one place. Um, I want to begin this morning, the title of this message is Fear Not, Fear Not, Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who's been crucified. He's not here, for he is risen just as he said. Come see the place where he was laying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead, and behold, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Behold, I, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they shall see me. The title of this message this morning is Fear Not. And I suppose one of the most famous uh, lines in American history by an American president concerning fear was spoken uh, by President Roosevelt when he said that famous line, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And now I thought about that statement i thought about it on multiple occasions, and I'm not trying to be controversial, and uh, I'm not trying to uh, uh, start anything with anybody, but when I think about that statement, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. When I think about that, it really doesn't make any sense at all. That, that statement has no meaning to me because I have never been afraid of fear. Fear is not what makes me afraid. But I have been afraid of a lot of things, real things, that cause me to be afraid. Uh, we're by nature fearful people. Uh, all throughout the scripture, we're called sheep. Uh, and I've never tended sheep, but what I've been told about sheep and what I've read about sheep is sheep by their very nature are fearful creatures. Uh, in the 23rd Psalm, we read where he says, uh, uh, He leadeth me beside the still waters, 
And they say the reason they need to do that is because sheep are so skittish, they won't drink out of fast running water. They have to drink out of still waters. And when I'm afraid, it really doesn't help me if somebody just comes up to me and says, well, just stop being afraid. <laughs> somebody, when, you, when you're afraid, uh, it, it just don't help. And somebody says, well, you don't have anything to be afraid of. When I'm afraid, I'm afraid. What I need when I'm afraid is for somebody to remove the thing I'm afraid of or to, to, to take it away. For example, if I sat down beside a rattlesnake and that thing started rattling its tail and I looked over there and that rattlesnake was coiled up fixing to bite me and you leaned over and whispered in my ear and said, now don't be afraid. I'd say, you're crazy, man. That snake is going to bite me. And so uh, my fear would not subside until somebody either removed that snake or preferably killed that snake because the only good snake is a dead snake. Amen? All right, got two. Amen. Uh, two times in this, in this text I want you to see, uh, in verse 5, the angel said, Do not be afraid. And then in verse 10, Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. The alternate translation in verse 10 is what Jesus actually said. He said, stop being afraid. And so this Easter, many people are experiencing various levels of fear. The levels run from mildly concerned to downright worried. Some people fear getting the coronavirus. I don't want to get it. I've heard of people that's got it and I don't want none of it losing their job losing their income the way of life that they've enjoyed or things they've earned uh, are being threatened uh, a lot of people are just nervous and anxious about when is this thing going to be over and I can identify with that and people say all the time are we ever going to get back to normal again and when we're afraid one of the things that happens in my mind, as I'm sure it does in yours, in your mind you start playing the various scenarios of what might happen. What if this happens or what if that happens? And if we're not careful, what are we going to do? And who knows? And what if they and all that? And, and, and you can what if yourself into a state of hysteria if you're not careful. And then to top it all off, we've got all these media outlets. You know, uh, they, 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 they put out all this stuff, and some of it is dire, uh, depending on who you talk to and who you listen to. And, you know, you can just read anything about how bad things are online these days. But it seems to me that there are people with political agendas, political agendas, and they range on both sides of the aisle, conservative and liberal, and they've got this agenda, and, and they, they want to hype the circumstances to their advantage. And so there's a lot of fear in the nation. There's a lot of fear amongst people. Even in the church today, there are people who are afraid. And so the central truth of this message is, when Jesus arose, he overcame our greatest fears. He overcame our greatest fears, our greatest enemies. And this morning I want to preach the good news. And the good news is that the greatest of all of our fears is taken away by the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see first off what made them afraid because what made them afraid is the th same thing that we fear. Now, as these women and, and us by extension and all the disciples go to the tomb, there are some things that they encounter. First thing I want you to see that they were frightened by was the wicked men who terrorized. Wicked men who terrorized make us afraid. Now Mary and the other women had just three days earlier witnessed humanity at its worst. They watched helplessly as Jesus Christ, the innocent Jesus, just loving compassionate Jesus was falsely accused. He was brought on trial before that wicked court, condemned to die, even though Pontius Pilate 
found him not guilty four times. And Jesus was beaten. Jesus was beaten. I, I ran up on that whip they beat Jesus with. It had bone fragments or, or lead embedded into the end so that they would rip the, the flesh off as it struck. And Jesus was mocked. He was spit upon. There was a crown of, of, of eight-inch thorns mashed down on his brow. And Jesus, the Son of God, the innocent Lamb of God, was paraded through Jerusalem streets through a jeering mob. And there were Roman soldiers, Roman soldiers laid Jesus out on a wooden beam and then drove what we would call the, the equivalent of railroad spikes into his hands and into his feet, and they crucified Jesus. Now, crucifixion, was a well-known form of terrorism. The Romans crucified thousands of people. And one of the favorite things they would do was they would line the roadways, a busy uh, street into Jerusalem or into a city, and there they would just line it up with crosses, and they would put people on it. And uh, they liked hanging their victim, victims in conspicuous places because that would send shock waves throughout the community and throughout the citizenry. And nobody would dare rise up against Rome because they feared crucifixion. And bear in mind, these women are on their way to the graveyard to see the crucified body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Sabbath was over. And now they want to go to the tomb to fulfill the customs of their people. And who are they going to encounter when they get there? The first people they intend to see when they get there are Roman soldiers. And I'm certain that it took a lot of guts for these women to just muster up enough courage to say, we're going to the tomb. Somebody has speculated that the reason that there was only women that went to this tomb was because the men were too chicken. Well, that, that might explain it. And the scripture doesn't say uh, why there were no men. But my point here is, is that they were fearful of the wicked men who terrorized. And how often do we allow fear of wicked people to freeze us and terrorize us and hinder us and scare us away from doing that which God wants us to do. Second thing I want you to see is that makes us afraid is when nature trembles, it causes us to fear. When nature trembles. Notice that when the ladies get to the tomb, an earthquake appears. Now, this is the second earthquake. There was another earthquake that happened on Friday. In Matthew 27, as Jesus died, the Bible says the earth shook. In verse 51, Matthew 27, Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. And listen to this, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming up out of the tomb after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now, the scripture teaches us that prior to the resurrection of Christ, when uh, people died, they went to a, a, a place. And uh, the Greek word was Hades. But in, in the place of the dead, uh, the, the Hebrew word is Sheol. And in there, there were two compartments or two sides, if you will. It was uh, separated by a great gulf that was fixed in between them, according to Luke's gospel. And, and uh, on the one side was the place where the righteous went. And it was called Abraham's bosom. That's where believers went, those who were looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus and his redemption on the cross. On the other side was a place of torments. And uh, the rich man died. And in hell, it says, in, in torments, he lifted up his eyes and he was tormented. And uh, uh, so there they were two compartments there. And uh, when Jesus died, the first thing he did is he went there. 
and he set free the captives. In 1 Peter, it says in uh, verse, chapter 4, verse 6, For the gospel has for this purpose been preached, even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the Spirit according to the will of God. You see, as soon as, as, soon as Jesus' body died on the cross, he went to that place of the dead and he preached the gospel. The gospel is just as it is today that Jesus preached. Those who believed, those who died in faith, when they went down to Abraham's bosom, there they were held in that place. And then Jesus went there in the spirit and he told them about his blood and they believed. Those other people, they heard the gospel, but it wasn't to set them free. It was to tell them why they were going to spend eternity in a place called hell. And then the righteous saints that were in Abraham's bosom on that day, as soon as Jesus died, the Bible says the ground shook and some of those dead people came up out of the grave and literally walked around in the city of Jerusalem. Now, I don't know about you, but that would scare me to death. Now, on this Sunday morning, those women are at the tomb and the Bible says the earth is shaking again. This earthquake was so frightening that it says in verse 4 that those guards, the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Those guards were, were tough men, but they were afraid. And when nature trembles, it is a scary Thing. I don't know if you've ever been in the path of a tornado. I, I've sat and watched a tornado uh, come very close to where I'm at, and I see debris. I've seen, I've seen vehicles going around in, in, in a tornado, and parts of houses and swing sets and campers and all that stuff just going around all at one time in a tornado. And uh, I don't know, nature is a devastating thing. Think about a hurricane and the force and the wind that comes from a hurricane. In uh, 1912, there was an earthquake in West Tennessee and in Arkansas. And that earthquake in 1912 was so powerful, it literally made the Mississippi River run backwards. And it formed a lake that is still in West Tennessee. It's one of the best fishing lakes in Tennessee called Real Foot Lake. And it was formed because of an earthquake that made the Mississippi River run backwards. And so when nature trembles, it can be a terrifying thing. And then the third thing I want you to see is when death traumatizes, we are afraid. The most difficult thing that we deal with, I'm certain, is death. Now, I don't want to die. I don't know about anybody else in here, but I don't want to. Uh, I've often said I don't mind being dead. I just don't want the process of dying. Uh, the process is frightening me. I, I jokingly say to people sometimes, I think we'd all be better off if we get killed before we die. You know, because uh, you don't see it coming, you don't know what happened. But, 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 but that, that, that lingering death, that, that process of our body just coming apart or, 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 or in, in agony for months at a time is just something that, that scares us. And, and the point is that death and the process of death makes us afraid. Now, the reason uh, we take all these precautions, you know, social distancing and uh, uh, wearing masks and uh, having to have uh, uh, sunrise service in a car is because we don't want anybody to contract this virus because it possibly could kill them. And we don't want to see anybody die. And, and I've been watching, you know, every day on television, we're seeing a body count. This is how many people died in Maryland today. This is how many people have died in the District of Columbia today. This is how many people have died in America today. This is how many people have died worldwide from the coronavirus. And every day we're getting this, 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 this body count. And people are saying this virus is going to increase death by so many thousands. Beloved, I've got to tell you something. This virus is not going to increase death, not at all. Death is 100%. Everybody's going to die. The Bible says that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after death, the judgment. And I suppose one of the scariest things about death 
is that we don't know who it's coming for next. We don't know who it's coming for next. Jesus' death was especially traumatizing. It was traumatizing because Jesus was only 33 years old. Wow, I remember when I thought 30 was old, but now, <laughs> beloved, I'm here to tell you, 30 is young. And Jesus also, uh, it, 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 to watch him die or to see him die was especially traumatizing because Jesus had such spiritual power. He healed other people. Jesus was in a boat and, and in the middle of a storm and he spoke to nature and he made it calm. He was that powerful. Jesus multitude or multiplied bread and fish and fed a whole multitude. And the people knew that Jesus was that prophet like Moses who would come and feed the people bread from heaven. And Jesus was the king of Israel, the one that they had so long waited for. How could it be that he could die? Jesus stood at the grave of Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. And when he said, uh, roll the stone away, they said, Jesus, he's been there four days. He's going to be stinking. Jesus still said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came up out of that grave. And have you ever thought about this? That... When they saw Jesus crucified with all of their hopes and all of this power and all these miracles that he'd done, when they saw Jesus crucified, surely the thought must have went through them, if evil can kill this one, what does that mean? I mean, if Jesus, the Son of God, can be crucified by men who terrorize, if Jesus, who's the Son of God, can be sealed up in a tomb and nature can have him encapsulated, if Jesus, the Son of God, can be crucified, then what does that mean? I know, and many of you know better than I do, that the trauma of death causes us to question everything we know and have been taught about God. It causes us to question everything we know and everything we've been taught about God when somebody we love dies. And some of the questions that cloud our minds when we're traumatized by grief and sudden death scare us. It frightens us. And then there's a fourth thing I want you to see they were frightened of, and that is when the supernatural is tangible, we become afraid. When the supernatural is tangible. Now, remember the scene here. They're in a graveyard. <laughs> I don't know how many stories and books take place in the setting of a graveyard. I mean, there's something spooky about a graveyard. I mean, nobody wants to spend their honeymoon in a graveyard. No, nobody has picnics in the graveyard unless you're the Adams family. I mean, I just don't know who would do such a thing. And in their day, most of the people, most of the people were extremely superstitious. I think, I think people today are pretty superstitious, to be honest with you. And, and, and there they are in a graveyard and get the picture they're in a graveyard the ground is shaking the guards are terrified and the stone is rolled away and out of nowhere some angels appear and I don't know every thought in the world probably going through their mind who are these guys what are they doing here what in the world is going on? I mean, when's the last time you were at the, uh, the, the grave site of one of your loved ones and all of a sudden the ground started shaking and the, and the, and the, and the ground busted open and the, and the lid on that, on that thing was open and then there were some angels standing there? i tell you what, uh, I'd be wondering, I'd be wondering, uh, one, one thought I'm sure that would go through my mind is, did I just die and not know it? 
I, I mean, what just happened? Am I dying? Uh, am I about to die? Are, are these angels here coming to get me? Is that what it is? Did they come? Because, you know, you read in the Bible where it said the poor man died and the angels came and carried him to Abraham's bosom. I'd be, I'd be thinking, is this my time? What in the world's going on? Or maybe you think, is this the end of the world? Has God come to judge my sins? And so those four things are going on all at once there at the graveside. You had the, the terror of wicked men. You had the trembling of nature. You had the trauma of death. And you had tangible, supernatural angels. And notice what it says in verse 5. The angel said, Do not be afraid. But it's not down until verse 8 where it says, They left the tomb quickly, notice that, with fear. The angel said, Don't be afraid. But when the angel said it, they were still afraid. Remember when I began the message, I said, our fears are usually not relieved until the thing that makes us afraid is removed or something or someone overcomes that thing that we're afraid of. Well, here's the good news. The resurrection of Jesus overcomes those things that make us afraid. Now, I want you to notice in this text, it says, uh, it's very subtle, but I think it's important. In verse 5, it says, The angel told the women, Do not be afraid. Then in verse 8, it says, They left, but they were still afraid. But in verse 9 and verse 10, the text tells us, Jesus met them and greeted them. They worshiped him, and Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid, or stop being afraid. And it's when they see Jesus that their fear is removed and so I just want to take those four things and show you how the resurrection overcomes them Jesus arose and overcame the wicked men who terrorized in Psalms 2 verse 1 it says why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing the kings of the earth take their stand the rulers take their counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. In other words, let's rebel against the king of heaven. We're all that bad. But the one who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Those old Roman soldiers, they gawked at Jesus. They mocked him. They humiliated him. They slapped him in the face, put a purple robe on his back. They said, prophesy, prophesy. They murdered him and gambled for his clothes. And those precious ladies knew they had to walk past that horde of wicked men, Roman murderers, to anoint the body of Jesus. And about the time they arrived, something glorious happened. The earth shook. And did you notice what it said in verse 4? Those guards shook for fear of him and became like a dead man. Praise God. I would, I would have liked to have been there, wouldn't you? I would have liked to ask that band of cutthroat soldiers, hey, dude, who's in charge now? Praise God. You know, uh, I read about uh, the American POWs over in the Philippines during the Second World War. The Japanese were extremely and exceedingly brutal to the POWs in, in the Philippines. And prior to the liberation, there was uh, the, the, the leader of the, the commander of all the Americans who were in the POW camp. He was, he was starving to death and he was walking with a cane. And, and the sadistic leader of the POW camp just seemed to take uh, a lot of pleasure in, in, in especially tormenting this guy. But as soon as uh, the U.S. troops came in there and General MacArthur came with the army and they liberated the Philippines, that old boy went into that POW camp. He walked up to the office of that former captain of that guard and he walked in there and he took that cane that he had been walking on and he slapped it across the desk and he looked him in the face and he said, I want you to understand something. My general has defeated your general and now I'm in charge. Hallelujah. You know when Jesus... Jesus rose from the grave. Those Roman soldiers who thought they were in charge on Friday, 
they didn't see Sunday coming. Hallelujah. On Sunday morning, that group of thugs were shuddering and quivering like a bunch of kids that just got caught stealing candy. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 37, verse 5 and 6, I've seen the wicked, violent men spreading himself like a luxuriant tree in its native soil. Then he passed away, and lo, he was no more. I sought for him, and he could not be found. And it's because he lives that one of these days, and you and I can depend on it, one of these days when Jesus Christ returns, and I don't believe it's going to be very long, I believe that those who've teamed up with wickedness and corruption, the Bible says that Lord Jesus Christ will come with flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that do not know God. Hallelujah. Uh, We don't have to worry about wicked men. They're not going to rule forever. Amen. The second thing is, when Jesus rose, he overcame trembling nature. Now, there are a lot of people these days who are worried about the future of the planet. Just, just uh, I, I, I watched some of these people, and I saw this thing on uh, this video the other day. This, this woman was out apologizing to a tree. Uh, <laughs> now, there was a time on, uh, in our society when that would get you institutionalized, but uh, this is becoming normal, worried about the planet. Now, I believe, and I believe it's biblical, that we ought to practice reasonable conservation. Reasonable conservation. But God created this earth, and he told man to, to uh, be the steward over it. And we ought, to, we ought to practice good conservation. We ought, to, we ought to be good stewards of all the natural resources. But I have to say, I'm not in the least bit worried or concerned. Fact is, I don't give a rip about climate change. Uh, you say, don't you believe the science? I, I, I believe the science. I believe science is true. But I believe the Word of God before I believe science. And you see, the Word of God has already told us what is going to happen to planet Earth. It's already said. And and when the Word of God tells us what's going to happen to planet Earth, there's not one single politician and not one single scientist that can do one thing to slow it down or stop it. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3.10, The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Now tell me about global warming. And until then, listen, until then, the Bible says there will be famines, plagues, and earthquakes in various places, not because God can't control but because God does control. And on that glorious resurrection morning, it was the Lord Jesus Christ and and his resurrection that caused the world to shake. And God is in control of all nature. God controls the rising of the oceans. God controls the temperatures of the glaciers. He controls the spread of the locusts. And he also controls the coronavirus. Somebody said, well, do you think the Lord sent this virus to the world? Well, all I can say is he didn't tell me one way or the other. But I do know this. He who arose from the grave is able to stop this virus anytime he wants to. And Come what may, the Bible says in Psalms 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, and though the waters roar and foam, and though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. Dear Christian brother, dear Christian sister, are you afraid of catching the coronavirus? Are you afraid that one of your loved ones may fall ill? Well, on this Easter Sunday morning, I can't promise you that they won't. But I can tell you this. Look to the risen Savior this morning. And by faith, look at the one who the ground couldn't hold. And turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And then the third thing, Jesus rose. He overcame the trauma of death. Oh, death stalks us all and it it causes us all to be afraid. It breaks our heart to bury a dear 
person. But because he lives, we know that those of our loved ones who trusted him as their Savior are safe in heaven. And we're going to meet them there. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I don't know how unbelievers deal with sudden death. I can't imagine losing a spouse, a precious child, or somebody very precious without any hope of heaven. This past year, Cindy and I watched as her precious parents married 74 years. One died just after Easter last year. The other died right after Thanksgiving. And this year, the truth of the Scriptures has become more exceedingly sweet than ever before. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 says, When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? And you see, the Bible says we do not grieve as others grieve who have no hope. We don't grieve like others who have no hope because he lives. And because he lives, we know they live. And because he lives, we know that our precious loved ones live in Christ. And because he lives, all fear is gone, that, like the song says. And he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. And then, the last thing, Jesus arose. He overcame the tangible supernatural. The fear of being in the presence of God is gone because Jesus is arisen. On that resurrection Sunday, that angel appeared in that graveyard. And, and I'm wondering who they thought he was. Like I said, it isn't every day that you go out to the graveyard and an angel shows up. I believe if I was out in the graveyard and the angel showed up, I'd be kind of like Ebenezer Scrooge in that, in that thing. I believe he'd be going to take me through my life and show me all the bad things I've done. I'd be scared to death. The world was shaking. The grave was open. And standing before them was this otherworldly creature from another sphere. He's tangible right before them. And surely they must have thought this is the end. And the angel tells them to go back and, and tell everybody that Jesus has risen and they're headed back to town to tell the disciples. And yet, on the way back, they're still, they're still scared. They're still afraid to the core because of this supernatural visitation that they just experienced in the graveyard. And then suddenly, everything changed. They saw Jesus. It was Jesus who calmed their fear. The resurrection of Jesus did not sing, signal to them the end of the world. The resurrection of Jesus signaled to them a new beginning for the world. In Psalm 118, verse 24, the Bible says, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. They saw him and they realized that the gates of hell did not prevail against him. When they saw Jesus, they realized that the ground couldn't keep him buried. When they saw Jesus, they knew for certain that the Romans, although they could whip him, they could beat him, they could drive nails into his hands and crush uh, thorns down onto his head and even take a spear and cram it in his side, they could do all that, but they couldn't keep him dead. Hallelujah. They saw him, they saw Jesus resurrected, and they realized that no power of hell can stop him. They saw, they touched, they listened, and they believed this is the one who all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto him. They saw him, this Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so this morning, what we need to ask is, do we have eyes of faith? Are we able to look through our eyes of faith this morning and see the resurrected Jesus? 
Because if we can get our eyes on him, he'll take our fears away. Because he's coming back. This one who rose from the grave and who says, fear not, is one of these days going to come and take his people home. Are there wicked men terrorizing? Yes. But the Bible says when he returns, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Nature will continue to tremble until the Lord returns. But when the risen Savior says, fear not, we don't need to fear. And while people today are afraid of COVID-19, I would just challenge them to set COVID-19 beside John 3.16 and see who's the boss. Death still traumatizes but beloved, remember the one who robbed the grave and said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And I would ask you, do you believe that? And then beloved, one of these blessed days, the supernatural will become totally tangible. The kingdoms of men will be swallowed up and become subject to the kingdom of God. The Bible says in Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth passed away. And there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. God himself will be tangible. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. First things have passed away. He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said, I said unto me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the springs of the water of life without cost. And he who overcomes will inherit these things, and I'll be his God, and he'll be my son. Then, on that day when those women went to that tomb, then, just like now, there are two groups of people. There are people who believed and their fears were calmed and there were people who denied. We got to choose today. Do I believe in the resurrected Christ or not? And when Jesus our Lord comes again, he'll make all things new. Today I want to ask you, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior and Lord? On this Sunday, this Easter Sunday in 2020, in this weird time that we're in. Has there been a time in your life when you've actually really received Jesus Christ? Repented of your sinful lifestyle. Repented of the, uh, your rebellion against God and turned to Him for salvation. If you've never been saved, would you just bow your heads right now? Close your eyes. And let me lead us in a word of prayer. Dear Father, just, just, just say this. Dear Father, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for my sinful lifestyle. Today, I, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. I believe he died and that he rose again. I believe that he's coming again. And he died for me. And, and today, Lord, I turn my life over to him. And I want you to come into my life and be my Savior, my God, my Lord. And then maybe you're watching this broadcast, but your heart is not where it needs to be spiritually. Maybe you'd like to pray and rededicate your heart to Christ. Maybe today is the day for you to return and, and, and get back active in, in your Christian faith. Whatever God's saying to you in your heart today on this Easter Sunday, it's my prayer that you'd be obedient unto the Lord. Brother Kevin is going to lead us in another song. And you pray as you listen, and may God uh, work in your life.